आठ हेलो डूइंग ओके सो वी आर लाइव Right, so I'll just start recording. Okay. So let's start. Um, hello, everyone. it is great to be back with another bioengine webinar this event was made possible with the help of dr palak chaturvedi last time she was here as a guest speaker and today she is here as co-host she is a group leader and university assistant at the university of vienna austria thank you dr palak for joining us today and welcome back to bioengine i welcome all our viewers to bioengine a platform from which plant science research researchers and scientists can present their research to the world and future scientists can gain knowledge perspective and inspiration we do this through our webinar series interview sessions and publications thank you for being a part of today's webinar as more people are joining in let me provide some housekeeping information related to today's webinar please note that after attending today's talk you can apply for a certificate of participation For this you need to submit the feedback form that will be provided multiple times in the YouTube chat after the presentation. When you fill out the feedback form please use the same email address that you used in the registration form and remember to mention your full institute name and address. Mismatch in email ID may result in non identification of participants and your certificate may not be issued. You can collect your participation certificates after 2 to 3 days from our website. Bioengine does not send certificates through email. Please make sure that you have enabled YouTube chat on your device so that you can interact and submit your webinar related questions. we can collect all the relevant questions for our speaker you may also send your published scientific posters to be displayed on the poster gallery of our website please visit our website to register for upcoming webinars please connect with bioengine via facebook youtube twitter and linkedin i now request dr palak chaturvedi my co-host today to please take forward today's event thank you so much soma for the kind invitation and for the kind introduction so today's topic for the webinar is the memory of the trees molecular insight in priming and increase stress tolerance i am extremely honored to invite our esteemed guest speaker uh, who is an associate professor dr louis velado from the university of obidio spain i have been associated with him since last eight years so it is my extreme honor to invite him on bioengine platform His research career has been ex extremely and mainly focused on mechanism on plant abiotic tolerance, stress tolerance, and development by employing high throughput omics analysis. During his PhD, he started characterizing pinus needle function, functional maturation, employing proteomics, transcriptomics, and epigenetics, defining new key processes involved in needle growth directly related to the tree growth and biomass production. after the impact of this work he was awarded with the mary curie ief postdoctoral fellowship to join beckwards lab at the university of vienna where he was also my senior with whom i learned a lot of things from him for the technological part and during his postdoc he was he focused on the study of metabolic rearrangement in chlamydomonas under nitrogen and cold stresses also developing state of art mass spectrometry workflows which allowed to go further redefining previous pedigram and discovering new metabolic pathways involved in accumulation of sugars and lipids after 2 years in vienna he moved to check globe 
Center of Academic of Sciences of the Czech Republic as a team leader where he started developing a state of art platform for applying LCMS methods in finance growth growing around the work to explore proteome and metabolome while continuing his work in microalgae such as chamidomonas in the mid of 2014 he returned to the university of ovio to study heat stress and uv adaptation process in pinus radiata by using omics and integrative approaches at a different cellular levels supported by the employ model organism chamidomonas and arabidopsis thaliana This research line has been continuously supported by the competitive grants. Currently, his main research line is focused on combining natural variation and systems biology to increase our understanding of abiotic stress response, mainly in combination to heat and drought, acclimatization, and the memory of pinus species. He has contributed as a PI in four national projects as a researcher. in one european and nine national projects he has published 75 articles in the high rank journals 18 book chapters and edited a special issues in journal of proteomics in which he is also a member of editorial board frontiers in plant sciences and co-edited book in plant proteomics methods in molecular biology third edition according to google scholar He is highly cited researcher. Around three thousand five hundred citations are already there, and his H index is thirty three, which is an average, which is an average of more than thirty cites per article. He has published in most of the prestigious journal in the field of molecular cell, PNAS, blood, molecular cellular proteomics, the Plant Journal, Biotech for Biofuels, Journal of Experimental Botany, and so on. He is a usual researcher, a reviewer for the top journals of his research fields. That includes several, and also a editor, board member of a Spanish proteomic society. With highly, we are highly honored and glad to receive him on a bioengine platform. We welcome you on our webinar session. Please share your screen. screen. and we can then start listening to your amazing research talk okay thank you patak for your <clears throat> really kind presentation introduction so i will start sharing my screen and start this okay okay Is everything okay with the screen? Can you see my you can see my it. screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So then, I want to start today thanking Bayengin, Suo, Palak, and and all of you for giving me the opportunity of of sharing a bit of the work we are doing here at Oviedo with all of you. And today I want to talk to you about the memory of trees. So the main question is. Can a tree remember what happened in the past? Can a tree teach its siblings of what have happened in the past? So we will talk about it during during this talk. So as an introduction, as all of the different organisms, living beings, all of them need to face some stress situation during their life. We can. Okay, we can talk about some cold period, drought period, heat stress period, floodings, interaction with other living beings, even sandstorm, pathogen, pests. So animals can or have one ability that that is that they can move. They can move a little bit, just one meter, just to look for a shade, for look for water, or even they can move thousands of kilometers with. With migration, only to find the best climate, the best environment to survive and to and to complete uh, their life uh, cycle. But what about plants? They are static; they cannot move, but still they survive. Different plants has different strategies to overcome with stress periods. For example, annual plants are coordinated with environment to grow and flower when the 
environmental conditions are favorable, but then they produce the seeds, for example, to pass the winter when the situation or the environmental situation is not so good. Also, annual or biannual plants, they reproduce, let's say, quickly. So they, they can use meiosis, they can use sexual reproduction in order to evolve and to find uh, more adaptive genotypes in order to survive if the environment changes and, and become more stressful. So th this is possible because they are, they are at short generation times. But what about trees? Trees are long-lived species that they need, for example, in the case of pines, eight, 10 years, the minimum to start flowering. So their generation times are, are, are really large. Uh, <clears throat> in com in, as a result of that, the number of sexual reproduction cycle are much more lower, are, are, are lower than annual plant. So this tool that life give us, the sexual reproduction for adapting to new environment, are not so, okay, they are very useful, but they are not so useful than annual plants. In fact, there are pines that live so long. This is a picture of Pinus longeva. This species of pines can live up to 5,000 years. 5,000 years in perspective is quite a lot. 5,000 years ago in Egypt, the Giza pyramids were really brand new. They were still recently built. But nowadays, this empire has fallen. And also Romans rise and Romans fall a lot of years. But if you see this in the historic perspective, you can see a picture of this Pinus longeva. About 2,500 years uh, of priest, we have this seedling. Time passed, time passed, time passed. And currently, we have this tree. And this tree still can survive. So here is like a fossil. We have, you can think how many generations of other plants, of other, of other organisms has passed in, in 5,000 years. Also in humans, how many generations of humans have been in, in, in 5,000 years? But in the case of Pinus longeva, it was only one generation. So it limited its capacity to adapt to environment through sexual, through sexual reproduction. But you, can, you, you, you will think, okay, what happened in, in 5,000 years? Well, in this tree, have faced for sure a lot of heat stress wave, drought wave, cold wave, pest, the interaction with, with some herbivorous, some deer, but it's still there. But how can this, this, this pine survive? Because it was 5,000 years in the very same place without no possibility of, of moving of, or hiding or avoiding stress. This tree needs to cope with the stress and survive. How can this be possible? Okay, this is one question that, that I like a lot. And also pines are, are, are also incredible plants because we have another species of plants for example, Pinus pinaster or, or Pinus radiata, that they are not really so, so with the same capacity to survive for thousands of years, but they have a really strong capacity for adapting and, and for growing in, in, in different places. For example, Pinus pinaster is a Mediterranean pine. It's one of the pines that we are working with together with Pinus radiata, and this pine, as Pinot Radiata has uh, a really nice uh, characteristic for timber industry. They grow fast, they produce more or less good. Uh, good. You can get uh, other products like trementine, produce mushrooms, etc. But also it is a really nice experimental system because for example, Pinus Pinaster grow in the north of Morocco, in the Atlas mountains, also grow in the islands from Italy, some islands from Greece, that is Mediterranean climate, really warm uh, summers, not so cold winters, not so many water availability during the summer, but at the same way, they grow in the Atlantic part of Europe, the north of Spain, the Britain, from France, uh, from France. And here there is cold summers, cold winters, very rainy days, but still they can adapt and they can produce. As because of this characteristic of, of, of for timber industry, Pinus pinaster have been introduced in United States, Chile, Argentina, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Tunis, uh, Turkey, and in all of these places, 
these species become an invasive species. Why? Because Pinus pinaster has a really, really, really impressive capacity to adapt to new environments. So here, I also like to raise uh, more questions. So why this species arrival to acclimate and adapt so well? This is striking, really, the capacity that this species has. Which are molecular mechanism, the molecular mechanisms behind this acclimation and adaptation? How this happened? How this happened at molecule, at molecule point of view, from a cell point of view? And considering that we are working with pies that are not sequenced, that their genomes are really large, we are talking about more than 20 gigabase pairs, at least 200 times uh, the genome size of Arabidopsis, 100 times the genome size of mice. How can we perform molecular analysis in these species? So this is what we do at my group. We want to use pines with as model species for understand how these wonderful species adapt to stress, have memory to stress, and, and can survive and, uh, and colonize new, new environments. So we are here in the north of Spain, Atlantic Spain, very rainy days. And this is our accounts, social media accounts, if we want to follow. And yeah, this is this is our main question. Okay. Will plants be able to acclimate and ultimately adapt to new climate as climate change is changing our environment so quickly? So for doing that, we use omic analysis, we use molecular analysis, we use transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, also physiological profiling. And yeah, all of everything is based on, on this. All of you are familiar to that. We have a genome. From genes, we have transcription to get messenger RNA. From messenger yeah, RNA, we have translation to get the proteins. And from proteins, through their enzymatic activity, their catalytic activity, we have metabolites. So in a model species, even in a pine, we have all of how to say it, we have a, a lot of intermediate regulatory step, epigenetic modifications, post-translational modifications, post-translational modification. So we cannot predict the response of an organism from its genome or its tranches of, or its tranches, transcript, I'm sorry. So why? This is our, our basis for studying, okay? A genome that we don't have, in principle, epigenome that we don't have, transcriptome, proteome, metabolome. So all the combination of all of these levels, we give you the final phenotype of the plant. And in principle, uh, following the, the, the central dogma of molecular biology, you may think that if we have a genome or we manage to get a genome, we will get everything of this and we can predict the genotype. But this is not possible. This is a, a really funny thing here that we have a lot of interactions. Metabolites can interact with transcriptome, with epigenome, with proteome. Proteins can interact with for modulating transcription from modulating metabolites for modulating epigenome. And all of this is modulated by environment. So this is really difficult to predict. We need to perform um, a lot of empiric assays. We need to make experiments to see how the different omic levels interact to each other to give the phenotype under different environmental conditions. So for this, we use in my group a lot of computer science for modeling, functional networking, processing sequences, and our base is the omic sciences. We use omics as input for our models, as read from our model, and a reference for validating everything. So we see data in the form of matrices. From this, we can model pathways, we can use variable correlation, we can reduce dimensionality. We will see examples of all of this in my talk, so don't freak out about all of this, this math, just only have this in mind for, for a better understanding. And the same picture than before, but with new layer of bioinformatics, okay? This was so complex, but you probably will understand what we aim to do with this example. This is a map, a map from Oviedo, when we have all of the drown, all of the streets, but without no name. We can improve this map. How can we improve this map, for example? 
we can use a picture, a satellite picture, so we get the information on the street and we see how the how the different buildings are, can give us more information. If we have a new layer, we can get the street names, the business names, so we will get really more information of the of this of this map. And also, if we want to move, if we see, want to see how dynamic is the city, we can add traffic information. And if you see, by these are the different omic levels. We have genes, we have transcripts, we have proteins, we have metabolites. And all of these different maps are really good, but the, the really good, good picture would be this, the combination of all of them. So this is what we aim. We want to see how the city changes under different stresses and under, and under different moments of the stress response. Why? Because from this, we will be able to model the response to stress and we will be able to select to select uh, plants and to, and to help plants to survive. And also, with this picture, you can see we perform a really untargeted analysis, okay? We are not looking, for example, only for shopping malls, that we will see only these two bugs here. With omic analysis, we look to all of the city, we, to all of the cell, to all of the metabolism. So this is a contrary to the classic uh, experimental, or the classic experiment. Usually, if you want to address heat stress, you will look for your biomarkers of heat stress and look to only that biomarkers, okay? It's like uh, this, uh, this uh, phrase is saying that we can see the forest for the trees because we are looking at a very narrow point here, but we are not looking what is behind of my collection of stress biomarkers. We are not looking the the whole the wall forest for saying this way. So we need to think different. And with omics, we can perform systemic studies. We can perform and study to all of the physiology, all of the molecular biology of the plant, and from that we could we can conclude. Uh, or we can find new mechanisms, uh, new targets, new everything. You will you will see how how it works. Okay. So first of all, I want to show you that using omics, is a really a non-targeted uh, approaches. It's a really useful tool for depicting how a plant can respond to stress and can remember the stress. Because the first thing that I want you to keep in mind is that plants, or at least pines have the capacity for remembering stress periods. But just before starting, just only to one, one slide to show you the complication of this kind of analysis, that is that pine is not Arabidopsis. With Arabidopsis, we can perform really nice and quick research because we have a lot of tools. We have mutant collections. We have a sequence, not only one genotype of Arabidopsis, but thousands of Arabidopsis are, are are sequences so we can perform really nice human wild association studies. It can really be transformed easily with very short uh, life cycle. Flora keeping is, is really nice. But on the other hand, with pines, we have only two partial genomes. We don't have mutant collections. If we can complete one uh, life cycle of the pines, it will take eight to 10 years. It's difficult to transform. There is no almost no, no databases with almost no annotation, so it makes all of the molecular work more, more complex. So before starting in my group, we need to work a lot because we need to develop the tools to work with pines as if they were Arabidopsis. So we perform a new analytical method for extracting molecules. We perform a new, or we created new databases, uh, perform a new metabolite and mass spectrometry strategies for, for addressing not only primary, but also secondary metabolism, and also perform a, uh, more advanced bioinformatics behind. So just only for, for a really, really brief, uh, brief summary of how we get the data in our lab, it will be very useful for you to, to understand how we get data. For transcriptomic data set, we perform RNA isolation, poly-A purification, that is messenger RNA purification, and we send them to a service for getting Illumina uh, sequencing. For doing proteomics, we perform protein isolation, then perform protein digestion, and then we resolve this, this uh, 
peptides in liquid chromatography coupled to orbital mass spectrometry, and we do all of the bioinformatic uh, related protocols. And for doing metabolomics, we perform metabolite isolation, we fraction our metabolites in polar and non-polar, and then we use liquid chromatography and gas chromatography coupled to high resolution mass spectrometry. Non-polar fraction, mainly lipids, are resulting in gas chromatography and polar metabolites, organic acid, uh, secondary metabolites, etc., are resolved in, in liquid chromatography. Okay, this is this is more or less a general scheme of how we get data. But we need to get data that is comparable, that this data will be useful. So for being useful, what we want to do is to perform extraction of all of these compounds, all of these RNA, protein, and metabolite for really the same sample. So we will get a perfect overlap between transcriptomic, proteomics, and metabolomics. Imagine, for example, this map, with different moments of time or with a really uh, a small seed, we will get not overlapping the streets over our picture and, and we will have lots of errors. So for avoiding this, we want to extract or we extract molecules for, from the same tissue. For doing that, we develop a protocol published in Plant Journal near eight years ago. And from the same sample, we first fractionate metabolites from RNA, DNA, and proteins. Then we take this pellet with DNA, RNA, and proteins and extract DNA from one side, RNA from one side, and proteins from, from the other side. We also develop some analytical methodology to allow us to use really a strong uh, buffers for isolating proteins, hydrophobic proteins, so we can analyze them and also perform some work in, in databases. And with all of that, we confronted our, historically, this is like a timeline, we confronted our first stress period, or our first stress experiment, sorry. For doing that, we took pine needles and we performed an assay for determining what was the lethal temperature to this species, because this knowledge was not available. So, oops. we determined that 40 Celsius was the best temperature to, to perform this, our heat stress assays, because from this temperature, half of the plants died. So for doing our stress assays, we, don't, we couldn't perform this in field, obviously, we don't, we, don't, we don't have this installation. We performed this stress uh, experiment in a climate chamber. This climatic chamber allows us to control light, temperature, humidity, etc. And we plan the experiment to see how a plant reacts when the seedling confronts stress for first time in their life. So we perform, we plan or we design a five days experiment with sampling control just before starting day one, day two, day three, and day five. For doing that, we we use a different or we set up a different temperature wrap. So control were grown at 25 Celsius during the day, 15 Celsius during the night. And when we stress a plant, we increase this temperature up to 40 Celsius in a ramp, simulating what happened during the day. At midday, the highest temperature, and then after midday, the temperature slowly decreases until night uh, temperature. What we found, Okay, this is, a, this is a picture of, of the climatic chamber. What we found? We found that obviously plant responded to stress. T5, so five days of, of, of stress, plant started to acclimate, and we see how we get some biomarker of stress, proline content, some electrolyte leakage, so membranes started to be damaged because of the, the heat stress. But also, it was, it, this was in the confronting in the, at the same time that MDA, per, lipid peroxidation, and another total starch, uh, total sugar sugars, sorry, first decreased and then increased. Why? Because at the beginning, plants needed a lot of energy to cope with the stress and to rearrange all of the metabolism and all of the proteome or of the protein in order to produce or to adapt, sorry, to acclimate. 
And uh, lot of physiological biomarkers didn't change. So this, this was a nice stress for us because we wanted a stress that trigger a stress response, but not kill the plant because we wanted to understand how a plant responded to stress, not how a plant responded to death signals. We isolated transcript proteins and metabolites and see what happened. What happened? First of all, we look with this Venn diagram, which were the transcripts that were exclusive of control situation, first wave of stress, first shock, and, and then when, when the plant was acclimated, and we saw a really interesting fact that, for example, the most of the transcripts were related to plant acclimation after three days of exposure, also the most differential metabolites, but in the case of the proteins, it was after one day, after one day of stress. Why? Because we thought that this happened this way, that first we get the genome transcriptome that is adapting, we get new proteins. These new proteins that are here are the proteins that will work for remodeling the metabolites. And then this metabolism remodelation triggered by these enzymes are seen obviously afterwards, are seen two days after these, these proteins are synthesized. Also, we wanted to see if the different protein stress or metabolites were related with the, with the same biological functions. So we performed this classic approach of studying transcript proteins, metabolites, one on, on each side. So we saw that, for example, under control situations, we get principally uh, glucolysis, fermentation, normal respiration of a plant, normal metabolism nitrogen assimilation, sulfur assimilation, but what happened after the stress shock? The, it happened that the main proteins changed. changed. Why? Increased the stress proteins, a stress signaling prote uh, proteins, is increased redox response pro uh, proteins, and also metal handling, that is also widely related to redox stress and development. This was after 24 hours of stress, but what happened after 72 hours? that the most important groups were secondary metabolisms and minor carbon metabolisms. Why? Because the tissues start to adapt. They were adapting. So they were recovering the capacity to grow, to produce new metabolites, and also to use sugars. And also, that is really, really cool for my side, is that we get increased RNA-related proteins and hormone metabolism uh, proteins, sorry, transcript. What does this mean? That hormones and RNA or changes in RNA are the key factors for surviving, for acclimating to stress and for remodeling the metabolism in order to cope with this stress. At protein level, we saw similar proteins, okay? RNA is related proteins, uh, redox related proteins, and also hormone metabolism and, and carbon metabolism proteins. And interestingly, also, stress proteins and transport proteins were uh, present during all of the analysis of stress period. This is quite important. Stress, you need to survive, you need to cope with the stress, and transport this is quite important because you need, as we will see, to move proteins and to move metabolites within cells and within cell compartment in order to coordinate a response for surviving. And in metabolite point of view, we only get a significant change of the metabolome in the categories related to hormones, mitochondrial, and signaling, as it's expected. Hormone is still doing their work, doing their work as a signaler, as a coordinator of physiological response, signaling, obviously, and mitochondrial transport. We will also use PCA and PLS that are methods for reducing the dimensionality, because for here, I, I forgot to tell you, but we get near 70,000 of transcript near 4,000 of proteins and also thousands of metabolites. So which are the metabolites and which are the most important variables within these three groups? We need to use a method to say, okay, these are the most important proteins, the most important metabolites, the most important transcript. So for doing that, we use a data, remit, data reduction of the dimensionality analysis, PCA, probably all of you know, and PLS. And doing this method, we can classify the samples. And as you will see, we can separate T3, Q1, and control when analyzing transcriptome, proteome, metabolome, and physiological data set all along, and also when we integrate all of them. 
with this class of analysis, we can check which are the most important transcripts, proteins, metabolites, and physiology, and we can build something like that. This is a heat map, but not with all of the variables in my study, but only of, with those variables most important for distinguishing the different treatment. And, and you can see here the, the heat map of TAF. And with this, we can also go to in more in detail and see which are those variables. For example, in the component one, component one, sorry, component two, for distinguish both, both data sets. In the component one, we can see which are those proteins related to first shock of high temperature. And these are more or less heat shock proteins. As expected, when the plant receives a heat shock, it starts producing heat shock proteins, heat shock proteins RNAs, and, and, and it's what expected. And also some uh, IPA, phytohormone, but this was not, this component was not useful for us because it was what, it was gathering what we know previously, okay? If you, have, if you give a shock to a plant, a heat shock, the plant responds with a heat shock protein. We wanted to see or to look more uh, in signaling and in memory. So the component two was uh, more interesting for us. Why? Because it was related to acclimation. We see different changes in ribosomal proteins. We see the, the, the relation of giberelins. We see the relation of cell synthesis, cell wall uh, in, enzymes needed for, for making cells that, uh, that resist this new temperature. And, and it was really, really nice because with all of this data, we can build or we build interaction network. And this was the really interesting thing here. Okay, and can I correlate the different enzyme proteins transcript to build a stress response network? Yes, we did it. The central of this network was salicylic acid, uh, total soluble uh, sugars, proline, NRD HSC hormone, and we saw that all of the proteins are of the variable related to component one, but on one side of my network and the other set of the component uh, two were in the other side of the network. And this is really interesting because in this part of the, the network, we get a lot of proteins related to rearrange of the proteome, all of these ribosomal proteins. We get some of context, uh, some uh, of variable related to cell wall. Think here: if I increase the temperature, the fluidity of my cell membranes become uh, higher, and the cell membranes become weaker, and cells, plant cells, tend to explode. So we need to get tough. Uh, Thicker, thicker, thicker cell walls in order to cope with this. So some hormones. And in the other side of the of the of the network, we get energy related to survive. Okay, heat of proteins and energy related, uh, photosynthesis related, mitochondrial related, and respiration related. So with omics, we can really monitor what happened in the tree in the needles when we subject it to a stress. But today we are come here, we are all here to talk about memory. What about the stress memory? Okay, with these tools, as we were able to detect this, this physiological and molecular changes, we wanted to see if we can uh, go in depth into a stress memory processes. So what we did, first of all, we changed a, a little bit our experimental design. Instead of uh, having high temperature for one, three, and five days, we also increase it for 10 days. And also, we get plants uh, afterwards, six months, in order to get them recovered. And also, we get a set of plants which were not stressed, OK? One set of plants, half of the plants, were stressed. And after this stress, we let them get recovered. And the other half of the plants were never submitted to heat stress. What we saw. And it's really interesting here is that a stress of a not stress and plant became after the recovery became uh, recovered. Let's say in this way, okay? But a stress recovered plant got higher stress, stress, uh, stomatic, oh, sorry, stomatal conductance. Also, obviously, uh, higher transpiration rate. 
but in the other parameters were more or less in the same in the same way that than non-stressing plants. But why the plant has increased the stomatal conductance after being subjected to to heat stress? We didn't know about it. So is this related to stress memory? Is this related to cell damage? We didn't know. So we planned a new experiment to check this, to check if a stress plant has some memory, the, the effect of this stomatal conductance. And what we did. Okay, first of all, just um, before explaining what we did, really short uh, introduction of a stress response to or plant stress response to environment, okay? Short time response or, or, or in one generation response, no mediating uh, changes in DNA, it's called acclimation, okay? And acclimation can be in two different forms. First, if we don't have any acclimation, okay? First, I have my stress, then I have a change, the stress starts, I get a change in my chromatin structure, then it's allowed the transcription of new genes that are in the, in the black line. I'm expressing these genes that are the genes for responding to stress, and after stress finishes, then I stop. The chromatin became to the original state, the gene expression stops, and that's all. In the second treatment of the stress, of the stress if there is no memory, I start and doing the same process. I feel the stress, I change my chromatin here in red state, then my genes start to be expressed, then I get my response, then stress ends, and then I become to the ground state, to the initial state, okay? This is a transit response to environment, not memory. But all of you know about priming. What means primer? Priming that after I get my first stress, then under a second wave, the plant responds better and faster. This is the black line. Why the plant re responds really fast and, and, and better than in the first place? Because the gene regulation changed and it became activated. And this gene activation performed or, or last, uh, we don't know the time, okay? But it lasts some time. And the, the frame time of this memory is the priming period. And also we can have a variation of this primary response that is a persistent memory to the to the stress. What is persistent memory is that the stress trigger one gene, the expression of one gene, and after the stress ceases, the expression of this gene doesn't uh, cease. Okay. I switch on this gene and this gene became switched on. Independently that we have a stress or we don't have a stress. Okay, these are the, the three kinds of responses that we are going to play with. And please don't uh, miss this acclimation with adaption. Okay, adaption involves changing DNA sequences. This implies uh, reproduction. And this, for example, the basis of, of local adaption, natural variation, etc. So as, as we see, part of this priming response or, or persistent memory response is based of changes in chromatin structure. So if we went to the original or the previous slide, we can see where is located the memory of the stress. It's only located in the nuclei, as it is based on or partially based on chromatin a structure. It's also in the organelles, it's in the cytoplasm. Where is the stress memory? If this memory exists, where is this? So we are going to try this to solve these questions uh, in the following slides. So for solving these questions, we adapted our experimental design and we took this part, plants that were recovered to stress and plants that were never subjected to stress. And then we perform the stress. So we will get a set of plants that were exposed to the stress for the second time and one set of plants that were exposed to stress for the first time. We repeat the same experimental scheme with heat waves, with sampling at T1, T3, T5 and after 10 days, and this is a picture of the, of the plants, okay? These are the plants that were previously stressed. We stressed the plants again, and they become more or less similar. They were not so affected from, from a phenotypical point of view. And the set two of plants, that were the plants that were not previously stressed, after we stress them, the plant bends, the plant start to show some, some hybrid deficiencies and, and start to, to to 
feel really very bad. So is there any difference about a part of the phenotype between these plants? Yes. You can look here, for example, the photosynthetic rate of the, of the plants that were stressed for first time decreases a lot after, after a stress period. In the case of the plants that were previously stressed, yeah, it decreased a little bit after five days, but, but the plant is behaving properly. Sugars didn't change, but in the case of the, of the, of the first stress plant, sugars change again. And also the response from secondary metabolism so that we can summarize it as phenolic compound. In the case of the, of the previously stressed plant, they were treated really quickly. After one day of culture, the different phenolic compounds increased, but in the case of non-primate plants, now we can say primate, it took five days in order to get a response. So brain effect, at least in pie, does have a really strong effect over a physiological response. So with this data set, we also, over this data set, once we prove the, that the memory system, we isolated, again, all of the different biomolecules, proteins, transcripts, and uh, metabolites. And in this case, we focus on the nuclei. Okay, we started uh, looking to nucleate proteome. Why? Because of, as we saw before, chromatin remodeling occurs in the nuclei. Response is uh, coordinated in principle by the nuclei. We will see that they are other, there are other organs in, involved. And uh, yeah, what happened? What happened at the nuclear protein? So after doing all of the techniques that we saw before, over nuclear proteins, we reach to get this interaction network. This interaction network of the nuclear proteins demonstrated that, for example, the major changes in, in nuclei are related to histones. This is thing with stress, non-stress plan and stress response. Also, RNA processing, this you will see will be very important. RNA processing, splicing, isoforms, and obviously histoprotein, okay? Histoprotein are also important to keep the function. When we look again to the different principal components and to see which proteins were more important for adapting to stress at nuclear level, we get proteins related to RNA, again, RNA polymerase, RNA, RNA, RNA processing, and also epigenetics, as adenosine methionine, et cetera. And we saw that different proteins cluster in the same way that these uh, epigenetic and RNA related proteins that were some uh, histoproteins, some uh, adenosine methionine epigenetic protein, etc. So we saw that really quickly that at a nuclear level, all of the response is really coordinated and it's really coordinated and it's settled, it's a table or it's a response that is settled over three different legs that are epigenetics, that are RNA processing and that are chaperones and, and, and protein control in the way of uh, histoproteins are in the way of uh, products, okay? Here again, if we compare stress versus recovery plan, the main difference are in maybe in proteins and histones. Also proteins related to epigenetics were the main proteins for explaining the difference in the response of primate and non-primate plants. And also we found really a really interesting thing that is that we also try to make some correlations between proteins and physiological aspects. As we saw before, even if we don't see it in detail because we don't have too much time today, we perform all of the physiological characterization of the plants. And we saw that there are nuclear proteins that are really related with uh, total uh, carbon assimilation rate, carbon assimilation efficiency, stomatal conduction, and also transpiration. So they are factors or these are elements more related to the chloroplast than the nuclei, but also they were nuclear proteins that were related to this factor. And we thought, oh, how can this be possible? How can nuclear proteins be directly related with photosynthesis? And when we went in deep uh, to this study of this set of proteins related to, to photosynthesis, we found in the nuclei, that there were a lot of proteins with chloroplastic function and also a lot of proteins that were 
synthesized in the chloroplast and they were moved to the nuclei to signal something. Okay, so we discover or we, or we propose that there is an anterograde and retrograde communication <coughs> between nuclei, uh, nuclei sorry, and chloroplast. So why this happened? Okay, this is the main question. So we propose this. We get a sense in the chloroplast proteom. Part of this proteom are used as signalers that can be primary or secondary signalers that trigger a response at nuclear proteom. So we put in our paper something like that, but we need to talk. Chloroplast and nuclei need to talk in order to coordinate our response for, for this stress. What was our next step? As we saw that, we thought, okay, then we need to produce proteins from chloroplasts in order to see if there are proteins from mitochondria from nuclei in the, in the, in the chloroplast and how they move. So we perform a new data set, a new proteomic analysis to go in deeper into, into that story. And yeah, we found differences in between nuclear and chloroplast proteomes. Obviously this was expected, but we're really different. But also what we saw or what we consider interesting was that we found proteins that were in the chloroplast and in the nuclei at the same time. They were two allocated proteins. What does this mean? That the same protein is making two different functions one in the nuclei or one in the, and one in the chloroplast, or the other explanation is that this is a storage in the nuclei or in the chloroplast, and then when it needed to make some signal, some process, it's moved from one organelle to another. And we found different, different trends. These are the most, uh, one of the most uh, interesting trends. It's in the chloroplast at the same level, more or less, than in the nuclei, and after stress, these proteins accumulate in the chloroplast instead of accumulating in the nuclei. These were, for example, proteins uh, related to, <coughs> to photosynthesis and to, and to protein, uh, protein, how to say it? Protein processing and protein biosynthesis, sorry. Cluster three, for example, this is really important because it were more or less in the in the same level or even lower in the nuclei and after stress is increased and these proteins are related to RNA processing. So this will be mediating processing of, of messenger that we will see that is really important. And also we perform interaction network like before to see what is the influence of the chloroplasting encoded proteins that are in the nuclei over the nuclear proteins and what are the effects of nuclei encoded proteins in the chloroplast proteome. In the first case, in the case of the anterograde communication, we saw that three different kinds of proteins that were there, that were redox related, were really related to energy production in the chloroplast, all of the aterpase complex, phytochrome, uh, cytochrome, sorry, B6F, phototropin, etc. Also RNA process, processing, so it's RNA chaperone, RNA binding protein it telling us that this RNA needs to last, uh, needs to, to last longer. Why? In order to produce more rubisco and more ATPases. And also his proteins. Okay, this is interesting because we, we could establish the, the relationship between, between nuclear and chloroplast proteins, but it was more interesting, from my point of view, the retrograde, retrograde communication network. So, proteins that are encoded in the chloroplast that travel to the nuclei in order to make some function. Okay, these are a specific plastic encode RNA polymerases. And what are doing these polymerases? These polymerases are correlated to the accumulation of histones and histone variant. So epigenetic in the nuclei is ruled at least partially by uh, chloroplast polymerases, by chloroplast proteins. Also, <clears throat> with chaperones and uh, RNA, uh, RNA processing proteins, again, RNA is quite important in order to adapt, in order to, to make a response. And nuclear RNA production and processing is also modulated by chloroplast proteins. And with, with all of this, we, we thought that, okay, epigenetics on one side and RNA processing on the other side. Is RNA processing 
related to stress acclimation. Yes, we, we, we saw this uh, indirectly. So let's try to demonstrate this experimentally. So then we focus on our, on our transcriptome proteome and we start to look for alternate splicing. Just as a very brief introduction, you know, alternate splicing is that one gene uh, will have or uh, can have different exons that after splicing can combine, be combined in different forms. For example, this is some messenger RNA from this gene with all of the five exons, making the protein A that will be better for microenvironment one or environmental condition one. But with alternate, alternative splicing, we can remove, for example, exon three and get a new protein. Maybe this protein is better for the second for another environment. Protein C is better, etc., etc., etc. Okay. But how can we study this alternate splicing from omic data sets? Okay, for doing this study, what we do is to take the RNA sequences and process them with a special with a special tools for, for determining alternate splicing. In our case, we use among other key splices. And from this, instead of having a normal matrix of one gene, one expression data, in each sample, we will have one uh, alternate splicing variant, one uh, abundance in all of the samples. Okay, we increase our samples, we divide our genes that were considered, or our transcript that were considered as only one to the number of variants that we have detected in the splicing. Okay, we define it, those uh, RNAs with differential splicing events. We perform classic approach and they were related more or less for to protein homeostasis, RNA processing itself, cell wall, solute transport and nutrient uptake, and also phytohormone action, phytohormone related, and RNA processing, okay? Depending on the first day of, of the stress or three days after. If you see at the beginning, all of the alternate splicing processes were devoted to change a proteome in order to get a response. And after that, we get a, a new approach in order to, to, to promote the action of phytohormones and the action of the coordinated physiological response. So what we did with this data set, we use a new methodology that is called MOFA, multi-omic factor analysis, that we took one layer of isoforms, one layer of proteins, and one layer of metabolites. And we use them to explore the response to heat stress. We get two latent factors. One of them, uh, or isoforms, explains 80% of the variance in one of these factors, and proteins uh, and metabolites is the, the rest, but if you see here, instead of using proteins and metabolites as the most efficient predictors for the plant response, on the other hand, transit isoform reveal as the main predictor of what is the plant doing. Okay, this is quite important because we were always talking about protein metabolites, but we know now that isoforms are really important for acclimating to stress. This isoforms, or with this MOF analysis, could also separate the different control samples, first wave of first day of stress, three days after the stress exposure, and also get those variables that were more correlated in the same way that we did before. But interestingly, we could also perform networks. And with these networks, this module three is one example. We see how the different alternate variants here is one one general transcription DNA factor eight, TBF5, first isoform, second isoform. This is a protoporphyrin nine, you know that, uh, chlorophyll biosynthesis is isoform one, this is isoform two. And during the stress, these isoforms are correlated to different proteins, okay? Isoform one correlate to a, a certain set of proteins, isoform two correlate to a different set of proteins and even a different module. So the same gene, depending on their splice, is working or is uh, controlling the expression and the production of one set of proteins or another. Here in the picture, what we saw is how the different alternate splice, uh, splicing variant changes during the stress. In blue, the expression uh, percentage of isoform one, and in yellow, the expression percentage of isoform two. If you see under the control, in the case of the first gene, the isoform 2 is almost not expressed, but after 
one day of heat stress, the second isoform is abundant in 50% to the first uh, isoform. And also after three days of stress, this isoform is reduced and isoform one started again to be the major uh, isoform. This is because of the acclimation, okay? Control, first response, I need a lot of this isoform and after the situation is more or less controlled, the isoform is not needed and their abundance is uh, reduced. Here we can see it from a gel perspective. In control, I have the lower band, the isoform one. After one day of stress, this band appeared and is kept after three days of culture at 40 Celsius. Also the same with protoporphyrin 9. If you see control doesn't have the second isoform, but after heat stress and the second uh, isoform appeared and it was kept. And also here we see the bad. And here the question is now, okay, isoforms and alternate splicing is a really nice mechanism to cope with stress. But is it related to stress memory? Can we say or say that alternate splicing is related to to stress memory, to priming. So we took the first, the same experimental system that we took before, we stressed the plant, we wait six months and we stress the plant again. What we saw that in the case in both, in the case of both genes, in the first set of stress, here we have three replicates, control T1, T3, T5. If you see a startup pairing, this one, then it was kept, then we recover the plant. But after recovery, the isoforms will still retain in the controls in the case of both genes. So this is a persistent method of stress response, as we saw before. So <clears throat> we can say that, that alternative splicing is, 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 is related to that. Now we are working on going in depth into this, into this, into these proteins and see why alternate uh, form one and alternate form two became, behave differently and what one of um, why one isoform is better for one environment and why other isoforms are better for other environment. But also in the memory, the next step to the memory or the memory is, is adaptation. So can plants adapt? Yes, can, can plants adapt? Can we know this adaptation or this process or this adaptive process? And can we integrate this omic with environments? And finally, can the trees teach all of knowledge to their progeny, to the siblings? Okay, so for doing that, we need to, to do some environmental analysis in pine. This is a classic genome-wide association study. For example, in Arabidopsis, we get different genotypes. We stress a plant or we phenotype the plant. We went to the genome, make association analysis and discover the genes that were related there. But in pines, this is not possible because we cannot perform this kind of analysis. So what we did, we went to the nature and see if some omic levels can replace the, the transcript level. So we have a common garden with trees, Pinus pinaster trees from different parts of Europe and Morocco, from Atlantic part, from France to the north of Spain, Mediterranean part, central and south of Spain and Morocco. All of them with different characteristics from the point of view of, of growth, uh, branching, stress resistant, etc. And this is our classic scheme, but what we wanted to do was not predict the phenotype from all of the different omic levels, but do the other way around. If we have different phenotypes, we can use this difference in phenotypes to see what happened with the different omic levels. Can we invert this, this, this association? Okay. Not really, but we can use, for example, metabolites instead of using uh, genes for doing uh, natural variation analysis. The different populations, for example, uh, that we have in the garden were characterized. We use the metabolome of all of them, and we try to predict the phenotype, not from the gene, but from the metabolites. Why was this important? Because this is, as I told you uh, during all of the talk, this uh, species is, is good for producing good. 
but we want really nice wood like this one with no knocks, with, uh, with, without these knocks that reduce the value and the strength of the wood. And these knots are produced when the tree branches and the different provenances of pine we are working with has different capacity to branch. This is called polycyclic. Polycyclic is a capacity that these pines have to produce more than one period of growth per year, okay? So usually pine trees has one period of growth per year with only one branch per year. But in the case of, of Pinus pinaster, we can have even third growth per year. So one branching, one level, second level of branching, third level of branching, one level of branching, two level of branch, third level. So low quality wood. So can we use metabolites to predict that or, or why this happened, okay? So we perform metabolite isolation of needles and only for metabolite uh, characterization, we were able to distinguish Mediterranean from uh, Atlantic from transition between Mediterranean and Atlantic climates. Okay, we were able to distinguish the origin of the tree because of this metabolite. And also if we uh, use uh, the matrix of metabolites, uh, the abundance of metabolites to predict how they can be interacting with the environment, we got different metabolites that were correlated to the environment, but not to the environment of the of the of our common garden. No, the environment of where they were collected at their natural distribution areas. So aridity, aridity irradiance. Uh, amount of water, of rainfall, altitude, temperature, and also the capacity of growth of the, of the different plants. This is important because if we can correlate the abundance of the metabolites within an organism with the origin of its organisms, it means that it's persistently, persistently encoded. So it's at nuclear level. So we are not looking the genes directly, but we are looking the reflection of these genes because these genes will give the plant a set of transcripts that will give the plant a set of proteins that will give the plant a set of metabolites. So metabolites are, are the top layer or the top omic layer that are reflecting all of the all of the levels that have below. So this is why we, we will are able to, to do that. And also we found really interesting things with some sense that for example we get some 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 uh, hormones related to branches, for, for example, sorgolactone, you know, strigolactones that are the branching hormones were more present or more abundant in those plants with polycyclics, those plants that branched more each year. Also, we get some secondary metabolites, uh, also acrylic acid, we found some metabolic explanation to, to this effect, okay? Cadavedo has more, more, more sorgolactones, for example, Lantan Rapta. Also, we, we were able to, to map different flavonoids, different phenolic uh, pathways that are really interesting also for, for coping with stress. And also, plants that came from the Mediterranean environment were able to cope with stress better because there were more facilities to produce polyphenols, for example. And just for not taking so long, but it's almost an hour, just for finishing, this is the main question. Can a tree teach its offspring? Can a mother plant teach its siblings that there will be a stress and that you need to survive and do this way, do the things this way in order to survive better? Is this possible? So this is uh, the main question, one of the main topics in, in, in plant stress biology or plant epigenetics today. And for solving this question, we need obviously a specific uh, experimental system that were really difficult to, to get in, in plants. But we were lucky, lucky because we get some experimental system provided by a forest company in Chile. This is the central region of Chile. And this company produced seeds that were uh, originated from clonal mothers. So two plantation, through clonal plantation. So for us, this was really perfect because all of the all of the plantation, all of the trees in the plantation were the same. And also the plantation were managed in different way. One plantation was not stressed, they were fertilized, irrigated when when the exact moment they were also pruned, they were 
also treated for not having any pests, and the other the other plantation were untreated. It was not irrigated. It was not even even fertilized. No pruning, no pest control. It was grown in the wild, and the situation of these of these of this plantation was really really bad compared to the to the well managed parcel. Okay, to the to the well managed par, uh, plantation. So here we have two questions with with this experimental system. Will the uh, seeds originated at each plantation exhibit specific phenotypes? Will the seedlings uh, exhibit differential stress tolerance? Were the, seedling, the seedlings obtained from seeds of the, of the stress plant plantation uh, respond better, faster, or, or in a differential way to stress than the seeds originated in the, in the really top plantation? So this is one of this is our latest work that is, is currently on the review, and, and we solved some of these questions. Okay, but for doing that, in this case we use an exotic, not exotic, but a different treatment. We move from from heat stress to uh, UV stress. Why? Because now we are want or we wanted at this moment to target chloroplast. As chloroplast talk to nuclei and chloroplast seems to control the part of the nuclear response, we wanted to target chloroplast. And the most effective way to stress chloroplast was performing some, some UV stress uh, treatment. So this is uh, the experimental design. Plants are grown at 15 Celsius during the night, 25 during the day, to be perfect. And we perform a UV treatment for six hours, sorry, eight hours. But, uh, that are coincident with the midday. And we do that for uh, eight consecutive days. And after that, we sample the plants of, at the different times indicated here, okay? What we saw at the beginning? Okay, so we perform in this case a, a really broad physiological analysis. We use uh, fluorescence measurement, we use uh, rainbow protocol that we develop in, in our group in order to check all of the, all of this physiological parameter for, from really small amount of samples. And at the beginning, what we saw is that plants from both origins, seedlings from both origins, behave really similarly. So we start thinking about that stress memory maybe was not real. But then looking the, the, the data set in detail, we saw that stress of uh, seedlings from a stress of mother tend to accumulate earlier phenolic compounds, okay? These are, these are total phenolic compounds, and in, in brown or light brown color are the, the samples from stressed mothers, and in purple, the samples from non-stressed mothers. So why these plants tend to accumulate uh, earlier these phenolic compounds? We perform proteome analysis. Proteome analysis of chloroplast, and here we saw really interesting things that the different seeds, the different seedlings, follow different patterns of stress response. Look to, the, to this left part of the screen, okay? We saw that plants, seedlings, control seedlings, then we treat them with ultraviolet seedlings, and proteome is quite similar, okay? You see that there is a really big overlap between control proteome and uh, the proteome after five hours of, of UV treatment. Then this is a proteome after two days of stress, UV stress, and then it's a proteome after eight days of stress. And these are not overlapping. What we, what we thought about it is that here the plant is happy, here it starts sensing the stress, but the plant has not the tools for quickly respond. So this is why it is this proteome is similar to control because they try to respond to respond, but the response is not so great. Then it moved to after two days to a specific response today. So, so we are starting responding stress, and then my final response after eight days. Okay, and it's separated from the other. But in previously stressed plant, so in primate seeds, what we call primate seeds, what we found, we found that this is a control proteome that is really different from the proteome after five hours of UV exposure. Why? because we thought that this seed has the capacity to respond faster, to adapt the proteome faster. 
you see this this distance, this separation. And also we saw that uh, the proton after two and eight days of, of, of UV stress overlap. Why? Because this, this means that plants respond, respond faster, and after two days, they, they reach the maximum response that they can achieve. So my maximum response is two days after my first doses of stress. And then I'm completely acclimated to this stress. If this is not what happened in control, plan, in control plans of, 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 uh, of subpopulation with was not previously, previously stressed, okay? So this demonstrates that there are some kind of stress memory, transgenerational stress memory between uh, mothers and seeds. Also, we try to make some network to see what happens within this within this different population and see what what are the relations. So in the in the in the seeds that were not stressed previously, we saw that most of the proteins are related to MDA. MDA, you know that uh, lipid peroxidation, oxidative damage. And to this is is everything correlated. Okay, everything correlated that are proteome, uh, ribosomal proteome related to this. So that means that I'm producing new proteins to, to cope with that. Some, some catalase is starting to have some response of redox response. And, okay, some, some small regulatory proteins, but, but if you see, there are not so many proteins correlated to that. This is a slow response. Plants, plants doesn't know how to respond. Okay, they say, oh, I'm getting damage from, I don't know where, UV, okay, but what can I do? They start trying and they start preparing to respond here. But what happened with the prime seeds? If you see the network is completely different. The network is completely different. So plants know exactly what to do when they get this stress. So we have total phenolic compounds linked to a lot of proteins, also photosynthetic rate this, uh, linked to a lot of proteins, total flavonoid linked to a lot of proteins. So plants know how to respond. Obviously, modern plants were not subjected to, to UV stress, were subjected to nutrient and uh, water stress. But this transgener transgener transgenerational uh, stress memory is also pan-stress memory. I mean, it's, 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 it's having prime or plants primate to one stress also respond better to other different sources of stress. And this is explanation. And this is what I want you to retain that. But they are pre-activated mechanisms to cope with stress. And this pre-activation was because of the mother plant was a stress. So it's a transgenerational memory. And we don't know why, if this is based on protein, if this transgenerational memory is based on the small RNAs, or different splice forms. We don't know what it is, but no, that this is that exists, and we explain that from the physiological point of view. And just for finish, some take-home messages. So yeah, proteomic analysis, you can use them for revealing stress specific dynamics at nuclear level, at uh, chloroplast level, at cytoplast level. And they suggested a, a role really important of epigenetic and RNA in, in acclimation in plants. The crosstalk between nuclei and chloroplasts is really necessary. And photosynthesis can be finely tuned with messages from the nuclei, and the nuclei can, can receive really fine messages uh, from chloroplasts to change RNA transcription and, and RNA biology. The small RNAs are, are, are really important, and also alternate splicing and intro rotation are, are, are needed for stress acclimation and memory. And also from, from my point of view, from my methodological point of view, if we don't have DNA sequences, it's not the end of the war. If we don't have a uh, genome you know, of our species, it's not the end of the war because we can address some basic uh, question, natural variation and, and population proteomic or metabolomic question, addressing proteomics and metabolomics without the need of, of having a, a reference genome. You know? And just for, in just for, for finishing, uh, Transgenerational memory occur, at least in pine seeds. We don't know the mechanism, but we know that, that seeds. And, and yeah, probably Lamarck was not so wrong or 100% wrong when, when, when we talked about evolution. And all of this work is, is part of 
first system roles of my group that we are a lot of people and I want to give thanks to, to all of them. Also, with to our collaboration that contribute with methods with their know-how, their expertise at the University of Cordoba, Jesus Corrin Group, University of Aveiro, Gloria and Arthur Groups, the University of Vienna, Wolfram and Palak uh, Groups, and all of you for, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. Um, so we have some questions. Um, from um, the viewers yes but uh, one or two questions is uh, actually related to today's topic and others is uh, a little bit different uh, one one question is uh, um, uh, that uh, can we relate this trace to the field crops uh, as you understand that uh, many people are yes uh, yes uh, okay i will uh, stop sharing the screen so yes yes okay Okay, Please. give me one second. Okay. Mm. Okay. Okay. So yes, we use pine trees as a crop. At the end, we are cropping, but for wood, not for food. Uh, and I do believe that, that this also applies to crops. Now we are starting to work with tomato, but I cannot uh, tell you any results because it's our latest project. So, so, so yes, I believe that. And also, for example, it was really, really interesting from the company because uh, forest companies, also crop companies, always think that producing the seeds in the best conditions will be the best for the later production of the plants originated by the seeds. And also they, they, they in, in nurseries or, or in pre-field, in some crops that are applicable to that, they invest time in, in priming the seeds. But probably you don't need to prime the seeds. Probably it would be better if you prime the mother, the mother, you stress the mother. I mean, it will be, in the case of forest, for example, of uh, forest crops, it will be even cheaper. Why? Because you don't need to manage the parcel. So you leave the parcel, okay, you cannot forget completely about, about this, but, but you don't need to, to spend a lot of money in managing these, these trees and, and in getting the best pest control or better fertilization and, and yeah, yeah. So, so I believe that, that this, this, this will be part of the future, obviously. It's not 100% one situation and 0% another, but maybe, Maybe it will be nice, for example, when the seed is saying in, in cereals, for example, okay? When you take your mother plants, if you can control, and if you can afford that, maybe when the seed is formed in the, in the, less, in the latest step of seed maturation, for example, applying some stress or just pre or flowering, not doing flowering because then you, you spoil your production, but just pre or flowering stress the plant in order to get this priming. I think mean, that this this is interesting, and I think that is a topic that deserves being being explored. Okay, and uh, is it uh, it is a perfect combination of omics applications, and uh, it is uh, for my own interest that uh, uh, sometimes it's uh, many papers look like that, that uh, the data in transcript transcriptomics is more. Uh, uh, then the, um, it's very less amount in source in the uh, proteomics level. So the difference is high in transcriptomics data and the actual expression proteomics data. So, but in your case, it is a um, little bit uh, correlated and it uh, shows that it's, uh, then what is the yeah. tree? What is the trick? The trick? No, no, not, no, not, not trick. I mean, I, for example, one trick that we use is that uh, uh, using this method for extracting all of the molecules from the same, from the same amount of tissue. But uh, is, is it true that if I took my RNA data set and I use them, for example, for making a linear model for predicting proteins? Mm, not, not, but if instead of that, I use this uh, new alternate splicing uh, isoforms for predicting proteoforms because we are using, for example, when, when you, we use proteomics, also, also 
all of us, of most of us, we took the database of products, I don't know, from your species, from military plant type, but you take the best protein. You are not taking protein forms. You are taking one gene, one protein. And we are we are forgetting about these, these protein forms as we are forgetting about uh, translate isoforms. So if you take this into account, the things start to be better. But complete complete overlap, no, no, because there I read, I, I didn't have this uh, empirical knowledge by myself, but the the how to say it, the half-life of proteins and its equivalent RNA is not the same. So just yeah. after that, you cannot you cannot overlap data set in this way. Sometimes it makes a coincidence, but sometimes not. And also for a scientific point of view, I don't know if it is good because you have explanation for all of them. If it fits one to the other, oh, perfect, it fits. If not, oh, we know that there are different uh, different processes for the gradient RNA and protein. So you always get a, a good answer, but it's not. And uh, for the replicate, uh, do you use more replicates, like uh, more than uh, we started? Five. We started to use three at the okay. beginning, but the minimum now we are starting to do experiment with no, no less than five, and if possible, uh, seven to nine. Okay, because you, you get, I mean, it's expensive, because it's expensive, mm -hmm. but if you want to go to, to small changes in. For example, if you want to see a, a, a type fold change with three replicates or four replicates, it's enough. But if you want to, to go for a one, two fold change of a really non abundant uh, protein translate that make uh, its role regulating gene expression, for example, you need to have a lot of replicates in order to get some statistical power, power that allows you to, to say something. If it's okay. And uh, have you any plan to make any genetically modified uh, tree plants on from that this information, or uh, we have in, 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 in my department we have some people that is transforming pines, okay. but the problem is that that all of the process, if you are lucky, takes two years. So so if, if we get something or when we get some interesting gene, what we are doing is using arabidopsis. We are taking pine and Arabidopsis here. We, 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 we search for Hortolo and use Arabidopsis natural variation and, as a tool. Mm -hmm. and, and also we use heterologous expression. We took the sequence from the pine and express them in Arabidopsis. Not because anything, I mean, I know it will be the best to, to, do, to do this in pine, but looking, for example, for our students, the students, they need to finish now for some European rule, their PhDs in four or five years. We cannot do that because of the timing. I mean, it's, it's not in Arabidopsis. You have it in, in half a year, let's say, in time maybe three years. So it's not. It's not. Yes. Some uh, transient, transient expression. Maybe one day we will do some. I don't know. Protoplast culture, if if we can, if we need it. But but no, we don't have this in mind. Really, no. pine over pine. Okay. Oh. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting for more questions because the uh, live chat is uh, already ongoing, but most of the appreciations of your work and your presentation and data, it's uh, sure. totally data-driven. Uh, every slide has uh, more and more data. And so uh, I'm sure yeah, more questions will come. Uh, so I let's... Yes. Yeah, so, more than the biologists, we are data scientists. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I request Soma uh, to go for the in interview or interaction sessions. It will motivate us and uh, learn uh, Luis more more perspectives. And uh, and at the meantime, I'm looking for the more questions if available. And uh, definitely, if related, I ask here. And otherwise, I email the Luis and the speaker. Okay. Uh, and uh, thanks, uh, Palak, uh, for being with us. Uh, it's uh, an honor to have you. And uh, uh, Shoma, let's let's start. And uh, we are waiting for more questions. Okay.
sure 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 this section is my favorite section because we get to know more about uh, the researchers uh, because you know we can only get to know them when they publish a paper but uh, through to this it's, uh, it's an interaction uh, the students get to know more about you um, so um, could you please uh, sir could you please start uh, by sharing your journey as a researcher with our viewers how did you start the journey how I started the journey, the journey. Yeah. Okay, so I think that like uh, many of them, I, I was I was uh, doing my, I'm a biologist. So I was doing my, my biology lectures and then, okay, for doing this, uh, how to say it in English, this uh, end of degree uh, thesis, my, my in my degree thesis, I joined a lab, the lab where I'm here. Why I use, I choose plants instead of choosing animals or, or, or microorganisms or whatever. I, I choose plants because what I'm interested in still today is in the methodology. And with plants, we were more free to do, to do things. I mean, for example, it's not the same working with plants than with mice, but for example, with, and, and then in my department, it's, it's physiology. I'm not physiologist. I'm more molecular biologist, biochemist. And then during my PhD, I, I started specializing. And then uh, here we were working with uh, aging of trees. Why the trees uh, age uh, from a, from a epigenetic perspective mostly. Mm -hmm. So then we saw that epigenetic changes, the epigenetic of sibling is not the same as a tree, but then I ask, okay, so if my global epigenetic markers change, that means that they were genes that will be differentially regulated. But which are the genes? Mm -hmm. So then uh, we started to do all of the molecular analysis of pine, and we couldn't do so much because we didn't have a genome, we didn't have some economic resources for doing transcriptomics. We are talking that about that I did that about whoa. 16 years ago. Uh, and, and if transcriptomic can be considered expensive now, imagine 16 years ago. And, and then what I did what we did what we put during my PhD. We published it in Pine, we did it perfect. And then we, we I got this grant for, for gaining Wolfram's uh, lab at Vienna. And then I changed completely my species because as Palak said, I was working with trees and then I started to work with microalgae. Why microalgae? Because microalgae was sequenced, it grows, it performs its life cycle in 24 hours. So I wanted to run from the limitation from, from pine. So then I, I learned a lot there how to do all of this homic analysis, how how work really with a model species. But then I wanted to work the same way with pines. So then uh, I couldn't work with pines in the same way because we didn't have the tools. So then I spent uh, two years, two and a half years or three in developing the methods for work with pines more or less like if they were a uh, model species. So developing the databases, learning all of the bioinformatics for creating the databases, annotating the databases, blah, 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 blah. blah. Adapting molecular uh, method that works uh, really well with clean, let's say this way, organisms like Arabidopsis or Chlamydomonas but didn't work with pines because they have a lot of resins, uh, secondary metabolism is horrible for performing isolation of molecules. So adapting the method and, and so on. And then I, I returned back to pines. And then uh, we started to do some stress analysis, ultraviolet, but I didn't say almost anything today, but also heat stress, combination of heat and drop. And then we have one problem that we need to demonstrate some hypothesis. This protein is doing that thing. Okay. okay. In Arabidopsis or in other species, the, the normal workflow is you have your protein, you have your hypothesis, and then you look for a mutant. And, or you create this mutant or you make a overexpressing line. And then you, you see if a mutant is uh, behaving the way you expected, then perfect because you are demonstrating what this what this this gene is doing. But in pines, we couldn't do that. We don't have mutant collections. We don't have the possibility to perform quick, quick uh, 
transformation. So this is why we fall into natural variation. We have different population of pines of different parts of Europe. We take the seeds. So we look this our mutants in the na nature for saying this way. Okay. And, and for doing all of that, I was applying first this European grant. So this European grant has some name here in Europe. So it opened the door uh, for, for the window or even the house, the entire house for them going to your national funding agency and say, okay, I got this, this grant, also this manuscript, please uh, give me some grant for continue. So then I, I got I got two different grants for, for doing my second postdoc in space in this way. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and this month I got my permanent position at the university. But this is a, this is a journey, and the, and the journey for all of the PhD or the people that, that is 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 uh, here today with us. It's quite important that that they are motivated. They need to like what they are doing because you need to work a lot. And in science, this work is almost always underpaid. So then you need to you need to to be yeah. motivated and, and it's a way. This is like a, this is not a, how to say a, um, a speed uh, run. This is a, this is like a marathon. You need to, to resist. You need to adapt to stress and to prove yourself uh, that you are resilient and, and, and with work, uh, you can, you can, you can get your goal. I mean, you don't need to be Einstein or some genius to, to do research, but you need to be patient and, and you need to, to work. And, and sometimes, or for, for example, in the PSA, sometimes you want to cry. And it's, <laughs> and, and that, and it's true. And, and, and it's, it's really bad in some cases, psychological situation, but, but it, the things always get, get better. Like yes. we said here, it's always a stop raining. Okay, this it won't rain forever. So, so this is, I think, one one thing for for saying the the PhD. And and if yeah, if I can share my experience or something has have, uh, have one doubt or whatever, they can always write to me and, and I will try to to answer. That would be great. Uh, so, um, according to you, uh, which sectors of plant science research will prosper in the near future? I think that three or four, uh, for example, one, we need to create some crops that produce more and produce in worse places. I mean, they, they must survive to, to some new pests that probably we don't know which pests are. Mm -hmm. But for example, here in Europe, we have now one pest from olive the trees for making olive oil that, that was not expected to be here in 30 years, but uh, due to the accelerated climate change, we need to, to do that. Obviously, there are some advances, for example, in, in, in growing, for example, rice in partial, in partially, in partially salty water. We need mm -hmm. to produce to try to reach another, another, another ways to produce in, 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 yeah, in, in so with better abiotic stress or abiotic stress resistance. And also, but so I think that is more important is that we need to do that trying to to do some sustainability. We cannot destroy the soil. And destroy the environments for for growing. Right. So it is this will be some nutrition. For mm -hmm. example, I need to fertilize, but I don't need to waste say, more than a half of the nutrients that I'm adding to the soil. I need plants that can take uh, more nutrients in a more efficient way from the soils. And, and the other thing, the last thing is that plants are not only food; they produce a lot of materials. They produce and, and advanced materials. We are not talking about, for example, cotton that is more important or good, but we can produce uh, bioplastics. We can use plants also for fix CO2. For example, you know, uh, trying to remove CO2 from atmosphere and keep them in the soil, for example. These are also future for, for plants. So it's, I mean, and if I start thinking, I'm sure that I will start finding, I uh, will find more useful things that plants will do in the future for us. So I told that to my students at, at, at college that plant physiology and plant biotechnology is not a death biotechnology. It's a, I think, most important biotechnology because we can uh, think about illness and we can think about uh, mobile phones and we can think a lot of things because we have food in our, in our dishes. If we don't have food, we cannot think in other things. We cannot think in, 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 in anything. 
so I, I compare them as the evolution of humans, of mankind, was after they discovered uh, agriculture, because they don't need it to spend 90% uh, of their time in, in finding food and they could start thinking. Huh. Right. So, so this is very important. I mean, it's the basis of everything. If we cannot have food, we cannot have anything. So uh, what are your thoughts on climate change and global warming effects on agriculture? What are my thoughts? That if the things are start getting bad now, I don't want to think what will happen in 20 years. Oh, yes. <laughs> Because uh, at least here in Spain, we, we, we have... Uh, semi-arid uh, climate in the south, but we have lot, tons of hours of sunlight. So most of the food of Europe is produced, is produced here, but we need water. But due to the climate change, we have every year we have less water. And also we have higher temperatures and also plants are transpiring more, but we don't have more water to, do, to, to, to water them. So I think that we need as a global, because it affects us, uh, all of us to think something about, or to, to, to think it twice because con before continuing doing some things that we are doing. Because for the, for the rich countries, it's really, it's really easy because they could always put money, mm -hmm. but we are not all rich and, and, and the planet is for, for all of us and all of us deserve the same things, the same thing, so. I think that I hope that, that this will be changed soon I mean, from some of the countries, but I cannot make it each year more contaminating each year going, for example, thinking in the southern countries to buy their food and to increase their food prices and make people of other places have hunger. It's not. So here is a, the role of plants, of plant also plant biotechnology. You need to produce food, produce food in a sustainable way and in a cheap way. And, exactly. and yeah. So uh, what is your opinion on uh, GM crops and their future? I'm, 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 I, I like GMO crops, but I cannot have an opinion about their future because it's a political, a political decision. Uh, for example, in Europe, Last month, uh, Europe authorized the the consumption the consume of, I think that it was seven or or, or eight new crops. Okay, it were the same crops and with different GMO, uh, genetic modification, but they are not authorized to be to be grown in Europe. Okay. So it, may, so it makes no sense. I mean, if you can <laughs> eat them, you can buy them, but you cannot grow them. <laughs> and, and 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 this is a shame because I think that. Obviously, you need to check the safety, but but it will be safe in 99.99% of the of the situation, and it will help uh, a lot of people. And 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 if we normalize GMOs as, as we normalize genetically modified, for example, uh, people anti GMOs, uh, for example, if they are diabetic, mm -hmm. the insulin came from genetically modified organisms. Mm -hmm. And right. they don't see any problem in using the yeah. modified organisms for for doing for doing this kind of of mm. of, of, uh, of drugs. And why not for eating? Also, it was demonstrated two years ago that agrobacterium, for example, uh, horizontal uh, gene transfer between plant species mediated by agrobacterium in the field. Yes. So you are doing the same in the lab. This is the difference. But <laughs> Yeah, yeah, also, um, yeah. I think they uh, authorized uh, to eat GMOs because you can eat and see for yourself. <laughs> yeah, and, and, uh, as I told uh, you, for example, here we like we like uh, a lot uh, eating pork or or eating eating beef. Uh, people is not having it's not having horns in the by the street. They are eating and the genes <laughs> of of your food. They are still in the food and you metabolize it when you are. Uh, digesting them and you are not getting genes for for this animal so but <laughs> it's a political decision that here I, there are a lot of lobbies that are making a lot of pressure about about this um, and yeah sometimes I, or someday i hope that someone will rethink and, and say okay let's do the things properly take not, time yeah not not without any control obviously but with normal controls, I mean, with reasonable controls. Not... 
so uh, uh, could you give us some suggestions on how to maintain professional collaborations? Some tips for maintaining professional collaborations. It depends strongly on, on people. Also, who are you? Uh, which people are you addressing? There are people that is more open, that, or there are people that is more close. Uh, and for me, it's as valid as, for example, or my experience contact some people face to face in a conference that writing some email. Mm -hmm. With this, with the email, you get uh, the risk that they are obviously all PAs that are really busy that maybe take uh, some days in answering your email or they forget to answer and you need to, to write it a second time. But yeah, I, I mean, you, you can contact people I mean, for the PhDs and it's my recommendation, contact them. You are not, you, you have to know beforehand, you will only get a, a, better, a better answer. And sometimes people cannot help you but they are they tell you but also they propose other people that you can address to get your to get your problem solved so just we are humans and we need to communicate so we are social we are social animals so we need to socialize in all aspects of, of life so i think that is the best the best the best uh, way and don't be afraid of of asking anyone oh, they are saying that they are stupid people in all uh, fields of the world and and you can get some such, and get a really a real rude answer and, and, and or even humiliating answer sometimes. But if it happened this to you once, you will get 99 uh, good, uh, good answers from other people. And out of this, probably you will get 20 to 30 positive answers. So you need to try and, and to, to do things. So, um, what would you advise the scholars who ha who handle long periods of experimental failures or unsuccessful events? So, how would you? Uh, what would you say to them? I say to them that, for example, my PhD took me more than six years. If I if I need to repeat my PhD today, it will take me six months. In the experimental point of view, that uh, failing is part of of learning. And obviously that you will need or you will always need to have a plan, a B plan. Okay. So this is my PhD. So I'm failing. Okay. It's my second year, for example. And it's, I like this a lot, but I mean it's risky and, and, and I don't know if I if I will manage to get something good from, from it. So maybe it's time to to think a B plan that you can live in parallel, a safe plan to, to get something. Hmm. Because at, at the end, with the with the most important thing of the PhD is having your PhD, really. But at the end, is having one or two papers uh, for other for asking doors and knocking doors for for looking for a postdoc, um, and and the experience obviously, and, and and this is why you always need to have a, a big plan. Right. But but it's yeah, it's, I mean it's like in life, no? You you want one thing, but you need to have some some escape plan in order to to survive okay so um and if the you... people is failing just just the last thing uh, it's failing in some experimental approach and they, for example one technique one lab technique that they cannot they cannot set up they can always write some other people that is doing the people some corresponding author from the manuscript you are looking for inspiration yeah. Mm -hmm. They are also even in YouTube. It's they are more protocols online that you can you can look. But yeah, we are social social animals. So use this our capacity to to interact with each others to try to solve to solve the, your your questions. Thank you. Um, so when you uh, interview to hire a researcher or a fellow, what qualities uh, do you look for other than academics? Other than academics, that. Uh, uh, that it will be a person that, that needs needs to be hard worker, but all, but above all, it needs to integrate well in our group because we uh, like to have fun at work. Oh wow! <laughs> uh, yeah, because no, because we are a lot of hours here, all of all of us. So we need to to be in good mood the most of the time. Obviously, we have so, some some small fights like a big family because here we are a family. It's maybe part of the this Mediterranean conception. Uh, and obviously, if we are here eight to ten days a day during the year, 
but we are like a family. We, we fight today and we tomorrow we are happy again. So this is what, what I look, someone that, that, that needs to, to have some qualities of work, okay, of science, but, but that fits in, in our group. So we look, we want to take care of one of each other. So we have our lines. Mm -hmm. We have uh, here in my group, we have three PIs with three different lines, but all of us are involved in the work of the others because the success of the other is, is my success also. Even if I'm not in the name of the paper, but we are like a family. So we are taking care. So this is what, what I look because at the, at the end, you take care for others. By, by for good or for bad, other will take care of you. And we, this is quite good for life and also for working because your network probably is will be is time better, 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 or larger, 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 and, and things will go better, better, better for you. So um, uh, you are the reviewer for many renowned journals. Uh, can you give our viewers some key takeaway messages for the stu uh, you know the students and scholars mainly how to improve manuscripts? This is a good question. I think that, that be, uh, being a reviewer helps you to produce each time a better paper. Why? Because you know what other people can, can, can see in your paper and how can criticize it. So for me, that one good point or one thing that we are doing here is that after we finish one manuscript, we forget uh, about this manuscript for one week, two weeks, not, not so much, but we forget completely about that, and then uh, perform a fresh lecture of the manuscript after 10 days. Mm -hmm. and, and, and read it uh, all from the beginning to the end, the same, in the same session, not reading introduction and uh, material method, blah, 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 blah. And try to see uh, first if it's as clear as you want, first if all of the content you want to transmit are there. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's like like if you were the, the reviewer, because all of us have some letters from reviewers and say, okay, let's go and I'm going to do a revision of my own manuscript. Hmm. And also if, if you have a near, a, near, a near college that also wants to, to read it, give it to them and, and be critical with yourself. Hmm. Be critical. For example, in the news, we are here, and so there are everywhere this fact check. Or if something is in the news, someone needs to needs to check the fact that it's in the news to avoid all of the fake news. Okay, so look if your paper has some fake sentences or fake paragraphs, okay. and you can do this yourself. It's like a like a second step in the in our writing process. And with that, after that, cross fingers and submit it, and and yeah. All right, so uh, we are coming to the end of the session and um, please say some uh, words of advice to the students and scholars who are new to the field of plant science research. Well, more, more of that. Life in human, human well-being and, and our life depend on food and plants are food. We depend also on, on, on producing new materials and also capturing CO2 and also even making new biofuels. And these are plant doing. So, if you don't think uh, or you don't see the importance of plants and plant biotechnology, you need to rethink and to and to and to see what you have because it's it's it's, it's something. But obviously, if I like uh, viruses, for example, and, and human viruses, okay, I don't want to see plants, but but plant bio biotechnology is pretty important. I mean, you cannot like it or you, you don't need to like plant biotechnology, but at least you need to recognize the importance of plant biotechnology. Like, like human or, or microbial biotechnology is really important, but I don't know saying I like plant biotechnology and microbial biotechnology is, is rubbish. No, 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 it's, it's really important, but, but yeah. And then if you like it, go ahead. And if you don't like it, uh, well, pursuing the, the things you like, uh, it's not plant biotechnology, but yeah. Thank you. Very well said. And um, I personally loved your presentation because you are a wonderful teacher, the way you uh, explain things. It's wonderful to hear you. you? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, thank you for including some basic slides like central dogma, what is transcription, translations like that. So it's uh, because our uh, viewers diversity is large from the uh, uh, graduation to 
scientist so it's uh, helpful all of all of our viewers uh palak you want to say something thank you so much lewis for uh, accepting my invitation well, and thank you for inviting me <laughs> yeah, and always enlightening us with the knowledge you have i have personally learned a lot basically my whole technique i have learned from lewis so i cannot thank him enough for the, everything that i know uh, so i all of your merit is your merit yeah. all, all i almost so, didn't anything <laughs> but it was really nice time we had a very nice uh, when i started my phd in university of vienna he was already there he was my senior and he really helped me a lot and it was a nice time in the lab and yeah and since then we are collaborating and it's uh, mm-hmm. we are looking very much ahead for more and more collaboration and thank you so much uh, soma and shuvo for really a nice platform it's amazing how you guys are uh, arranging all these uh, informative seminars that is really going to help the generations to come in plant sciences because it and also yeah. also make a good collaborative work because plant scientists are very few and if we <laughs> yeah. know each other then it's very helpful to planning the experiment or what uh, actually yes. we missed uh, before before going to the peer review so it's a opportunity for all of us and uh, i like uh, to if somebody someone uh, use this platform to connect with others plant scientists and plant loving people that then it's the really success of the bioengine uh, because it's for promotion of plant science and plant uh, research worldwide and yeah. they have got uh, many responses many countries in asian mostly are asian countries they are appreciating louis presentations and uh, they are thankful for that topic uh, that uh, uh, and uh, it it sometimes is such topic give us more perspective to learn many things and the applications of this so makes in a direction because in developing country we most of people are uh, try to include techniques but not the problem so it's uh, it's uh, really helpful that uh, techniques are available you may use this technique in a direction like louis did and uh, from from very uh, step wise uh, he now in the epigenetic or in a mitochondrial chloroplast so it's a very specific and very Uh, nice to see that uh, initially uh, our technique now it's a uh, solving problem solving at, at, uh, attitude and uh, pathway that it leads to the future of plant science thanks palak uh, for inviting and arranging this webinar i'm really thankful to you uh, thanks lois uh, for your nice presentations and work keep work and Uh, hopefully in future we also we will meet once again with your more more oh. success and more presentations uh, no thank you. <laughs> thanks uh, thanks soma uh, gracias for uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, helping uh, this 46 webinar in this race we are looking for our next Uh, thanks all the participant uh, for this presentation and uh, for the, uh, attending this live session and recording is available for your convenient time you can uh, watch uh, whatever you want and uh, i also mentioned the G, uh, google uh, scholar id of luis in the description box so his all paper and upcoming paper will be followed easily and he also um display and in giving a slide he already shared his uh, twitter handle uh, and so uh, you guys may connect it if your work is related I'm invited to contact me if you need something so yes because uh, my, my 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 affiliation is in scholar and uh, yeah everything is there if you need it okay thanks thanks uh, thanks so much it's time to wrap up uh, please uh, close the recording and stop the live sharing thanks balak yeah thanks once again see you bye you. bye thank you bye 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 bye, bye all okay. adios adios, adios. <laughs> muchas gracias <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Un placer.